Hey guys, I got an update about my World War II book. I posted that video last night at seven and I left and I went home. And then at about three in the morning, I thought, I wonder if that video got any hits. Oh, I wasn't counting on that. I walked into my store this morning and the phone was ringing off the hook. Uh, within the first hour of being here, I spoke to Rolling Stone. I spoke to Newsweek. I spoke to a ton of, I spent like all day talking to journalists today. I also spent a lot of the day calling around, trying to find an expert here in Minnesota who can check it out and tell me if it's authentic or not and tell me roughly what it's worth. Because the fact is, you guys, this doesn't belong to me. It belongs to a customer. The customer wants it sold. I talked to the customer today. We communicated about this. We have agreed a museum is the only one getting it. I don't care how rich you are, how much you're offering, because I've had a lot of wealthy people call me today and it's like, what part about this don't you get? One person came by today and looked at it and offered their opinion that it is real. However, I'm not gonna just take this one opinion, I gotta get many more. Even if it turns out that these photos are not genuine, this video and what I've done here has educated so many people about what happened in World War II. So many people didn't even know that. I was shocked reading comments like, wow, I never knew. Yeah, Japanese are just as bad as the Nazis. But here's my dilemma personally. The Chinese government wants it. I literally talked to the Chinese embassy today. What I don't want to do, and already probably the genie's out of the bottle, is create an international incident. And it kind of looks like I accidentally did that. Like I said yesterday, I want as many people to view these photos as possible. I shared them with Rolling Stone and Newsweek. What I don't want them used for is a political agenda. And that's what I'm afraid is gonna happen. Also, it is a whole book of photos. I want them all displayed, not just the bad ones. There's a whole story there. Now I've shared them with media outlets. I posted them on Twitter. I can't post them here. The video will get taken down. What I don't want is to give it to a museum and have them pop out only the pictures that matter to them and throw the rest away. There's just, there's so much history in this book. I, it all has to be properly treasured. What exactly is going to happen? I still don't know yet because this is still developing. This is not gonna happen anytime soon. I need to take my time here. I need to make sure I make the right decision. Here's what I can say for certain. I don't know which museum is going to get it yet. It is not going to a private collection. I promise it is not going to an individual. It is going to a museum. I just haven't picked out which one yet and is not going to the Japanese government. Okay. And I do need to briefly address the Twitter thread that is trying to disprove this. Did you see the whole book? You didn't, because I didn't publish it. Nice armchair detective work there. I will keep you guys updated as I know more. And I just want to say I received some really touching words from people. Thank you. Hey guys, so after the last video, I just wanted to give you an update about what's going on with the pawn man and his crazy find. So there you have it. Shout out to the pawn man for making sure that this piece of evidence is going to go to a museum and not some private collector and not the Japanese government. If you guys are like me, uh, just like I said in the last video, after seeing this video, I was really interested in finding out more information about the rape of Nanking or the Nanking massacre. So in my last video, I gave you guys a few details, but in this video, I wanted to go deeper into it because, I mean, a lot of things are unclear. And one of those things is the estimates on the victims of rapes and the amount of people killed. So I just wanted to go into further detail and give you guys some more information. First, some of the most common questions is when did the Nanjing massacre take place? And they're saying that it happened in between December 1937 and January 1938. But I've also seen some resources that said it happened until February. The second thing was how many people were brutally killed during this time frame. And I was quoting a resource that said 200,000 people, but other resources are saying it could have been more than 300,000 people. And like I mentioned before in the last video, most of these people were civilians. Innocent men, women, children, pregnant women were not spared. Next is who ordered the Nanjing Massacre. And that was General Matsui Iwani. And he not only ordered these killings and these rapes, but he also participated. Next, what happened to Matsui Iwani and his Lieutenant General, Tani Hassau, both of these, I don't even want to call them men, both of these fucking creatures were found guilty of war crimes and were executed. So again, for those people who don't really know what happened, or, I mean, I just learned about this myself. 
basically during the Sino-Japanese War, Nanking, the capital of China, fell to Japanese forces. The Chinese government fled, and to break the spirit of the Chinese resistance, Matsui ordered the city of Nanking destroyed. Much of the city was burned, and Japanese troops launched a campaign of atrocities against civilians. In what became known as the Rape of Nanking, the Japanese butchered an estimated 150,000 male war prisoners and massacred an additional 50,000 male civilians and raped at least 20,000 women and girls of all ages. Some were mutilated and many were killed in the process. In my original video, I cited a source that said that there were up to 20,000 victims of sexual assault, but other resources say it could have been up to 80,000 women who were sexually assaulted. It took decades for the city of Nanking to recover from this. After the Japanese Imperial Army had victory in Shanghai, the Japanese turned their attention towards Nanking. Because he was fearful of losing them in battle, the Chinese nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek ordered the removal of nearly all Chinese troops from the city. He left it defended by untrained auxiliary troops. Chiang also ordered the city to be held at any cost and forbade the official evacuation of its citizens. Many people fled anyway, but the people who did not flee were at the mercy of the approaching Japanese army. There was a small group of Western businessmen and missionaries, the International Committee for the Non-King Safety Zone, who attempted to set up a neutral zone for the city that would be refuge for non-king citizens. The safety zone opened in November 1937 and was roughly the size of New York's Central Park. It consisted of more than a dozen small refugee camps. On December 1st, the Chinese government abandoned Nanking. The International Committee was left in charge. All remaining citizens were ordered into the safety zone for their protection. On December 13th, the first troops of Japan's Central China Front Army, commanded by Matsui, entered the city. Even before they arrived, word had begun spreading of the numerous atrocities they committed on their way through China. This included killing contests and pillaging. Chinese soldiers were hunted down and killed by the thousands. They were left in mass graves. Entire families were massacred, and even the elderly and infants were targeted for execution. Tens of thousands of women were raped. Bodies littered the streets for months after the attack. Determined to destroy the city, the Japanese looted and burned at least one-third of Nanking's buildings. And although the Japanese initially agreed to respect the Nanking safety zone, ultimately not even these refugees were safe from the vicious attacks. January 1938, the Japanese declared that order had been restored in the city and dismantled the safety zone. There are no official numbers for the death toll in the Nanking Massacre. Estimates range from 200,000 to 300,000 people. After the war, as I mentioned, Matsui and his lieutenant, Hasao, were tried and convicted for war crimes by the International Military Tribunal for the Far East. Anger over the events at Nanking continue to color Sino-Japanese relations to this day. Another resource I found went into a little more detail. The actual military invasion of Nanking was preceded by a tough battle at Shanghai that began in 1937, in the summer. Chinese forces there put up surprisingly stiff resistance against the Japanese army, which had expected an easy victory in China. The Japanese had even bragged that they would conquer all of China in just three months. The stubborn resistance by the Chinese troops upset that timetable, with the battle dragging on through the summer into the late fall. This infuriated the Japanese and whet their appetite for the revenge that was going to follow at Nanking. After finally defeating the Chinese at Shanghai in November, 50,000 Japanese soldiers marched toward Nanking. Unlike the troops at Shanghai, Chinese soldiers at Nanking were poorly led and loosely organized although they greatly outnumbered the Japanese and had plenty of ammunition. 
they fell under the fierce Japanese attack. They then engaged in a chaotic retreat. After just four days of fighting, Japanese troops smashed into the city on December 13th with orders to kill all captives. And their first concern was to eliminate any threat from the 90,000 Chinese soldiers who surrendered. To the Japanese, surrender was an unthinkable act of cowardice and the ultimate violation of the rigid code of military honor drilled into them from childhood. This made them look upon the Chinese POWs with, with utter contempt. They viewed them as less than human and unworthy of life. The elimination of Chinese POWs began after they were transported by trucks to remote locations on the outskirts of Nanking. As soon as they were assembled, the savagery began. Young Japanese soldiers encouraged by their superiors to inflict maximum pain and suffering upon individual POWs as a way of toughening themselves up for future battles, and also to eradicate any civilized notions of mercy. Filmed footage and still photographs taken by Japanese themselves document the brutality. Smiling soldiers can be seen conducting bayonet practice on live prisoners, decapitating them, and displaying severed heads as souvenirs, proudly standing among mutilated corpses. Some of the Chinese POWs were simply mowed down by machine gun fire, while others were tied up, soaked with gasoline, and burned alive. Guys, as I mentioned before in my last video, I did not post all of the pictures that I found online, but honestly, it sounds a lot like what I saw. Piles of bodies, dead children, and piles of decapitated heads. After the destruction of the POWs, the soldiers turned their attention to the women of Nanking. Women over the age of 70, as well as little girls under the age of 8, were dragged off to be sexually abused. More than 20,000 females, with some estimates as high as 80,000, were gang-raped by Japanese soldiers, stabbed to death with bayonets, or shot so they could never bear witness. Pregnant women were not spared. In several instances, they were raped, then had their bellies slit open, and the fetus is torn out. As you guys can see, I left some of this passage out about what happened when some families' homes were stormed by Japanese soldiers. Historyplace.com is the source that I got this from, but honestly, the story was too fucking horrible for me to repeat or put on this channel. After this period of unprecedented violence, the Japanese eased off somewhat and settled in for the duration of the war. To pacify the population during the long occupation, highly addictive narcotics, including opium and heroin, were distributed by Japanese soldiers to the people of Nanking. An estimated 50,000 people became addicted to heroin, while others were lost in the city's opium dens. In addition, the notorious comfort women system was introduced which forced young Chinese women to become slave prostitutes, existing solely for the pleasure of Japanese soldiers. News reports of the happenings in Nanking appeared in the official Japanese press and also in the West, as Page One reports in newspapers like the New York Times. Japanese news reports reflected the militaristic mood of the country in which any victory by the imperial army resulting in further expansion of the Japanese empire was celebrated. Eyewitness reports by Japanese military correspondents concerning the sufferings of the people of Nanking also appeared. They reflected a mentality in which the brutal dominance of subjugated or so-called inferior people was considered just. Incredibly, one paper, the Japan Advertiser, actually published a running count of the heads severed by two officers involved in a decapitation contest. The only way to end this on a somewhat positive note is to talk about the group of 20 Americans and Europeans who remained in the city, composed of missionaries, doctors, and businessmen. They took it upon themselves to establish the International Safety Zone, as I mentioned before. Using Red Cross flags, they brazenly declared a 2.5 square mile area in the middle of the city off-limits to Japanese. 
On numerous occasions, they risked their lives by personally intervening to prevent the execution of Chinese men or the rape of women and young girls. These Westerners became the unsung heroes of Nanking, working day and night to the point of exhaustion to aid the Chinese. They also wrote down their impressions of the daily scenes they witnessed, with one describing Nanking as hell on earth. Another wrote of the Japanese soldiers. I did not imagine that such cruel people existed in the modern world. About 300,000 Chinese civilians took refuge inside their safety zone. Almost all of the people who did not make it to the safety zone during the rape of Nanking perished. As I mentioned in my other source, the Japanese did eventually declare that order had been restored and killings continued until the first week of February. But honestly, there is really no way to end this story on a somewhat positive note. This is one of the most horrible things that has ever happened in history. So I'm just going to end it on that note.